Welcome on to Pures TV. Right, well, there's absolutely no point in me going on for any further uh, duration here in terms of introducing our guest or reminding us of quite what he means to the world of cycling and what he's achieved. Um, the simplest way of introducing our next guest is simply by using two words. Eddie Merckx. Eddie, everybody here is absolutely delighted that you've come to the Ruler Classic and that you've joined us this evening. I would like to ask you if you can remember when your first visit ever to London was, as a young man maybe? Oh, no, no. Uh, the first time I was Island Man was in 63. And uh, in London, I think, it was uh, a criterion in uh, 75, 76, I think so. Or before, yeah. Yeah. I, and I don't remember, it's too, too long ago. <laughs> the, the reason I'm asking you that is because when you were young and starting out as a, as a cyclist and about to go on to achieve everything that you achieved, we in the United Kingdom <laughs> were not really on your map, were we? No, no, no. We, 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 no problem. We were not, we were not important at all as a cycling nation. No, you were not. Uh, at, no, now we as a more uh, bigger country for cycling, no? But uh, in the past, I have a good friend, was uh, Tom Simpson. I was together with him uh, by Peugeot, and uh, he was a very nice guy. I was also to his funeral. I think was all only professional was going to his uh, funerals. You, you attended Tommy Simpson's funeral? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I'd love to talk to you about Tommy Simpson in, yes. in a little while, but just um, while I've got you here on the subject of London, I believe that you're going to go and see a match at Chelsea, at Stamford Bridge. You're going to go and see Chelsea Football Club play? Yes, uh, next Saturday. Uh, <laughs> I go uh, watch uh, Chelsea Norwich. Chelsea versus Norwich? Yeah, and it was two weeks ago. I was uh, watching you know, near, uh, uh, Tottenham Anderlecht. I'm an Anderlecht fan. Oh. So, uh, but we, we lose the game 2-1. No, 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 <laughs> Normally we should have a point, but uh, in the last two minutes they make a terrific goal. And a Belgian guy, Dembélé, makes a terrific, terrific goal. <laughs> we miss the chance to win. Oh well, you can't win everything. No, no, fine. <laughs> it's better. It's better I won before than the Anderlecht like once today. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, as a young man, as a child, you were actually a decent footballer, weren't you? You took your football seriously, and also boxing. No, boxing no, that no, was only, so no, no, boxing never, never, but just, for just for the, for the, uh, uh, where I live was so, I don't know, uh, uh, that was like a boxer, but uh, never the boxer, was, was playing a lot of uh, basketball and uh, uh, football also, yeah. Which were you better at, basketball or football? I don't know, uh, maybe better at football. I was not big enough, I think, so for... No, no. no. I was young. At what age did you start to know that you were a talented cyclist? To know with absolute certainty, I can do this? Oh, you know, I, I won a lot of races as a young rider, but uh, also when I was uh, world champion uh, amateurs, I was not, was not sure that I would be uh, a good professional. And that, I was afraid because a lot of uh, world champions amateurs were not good professionals. And so when I won uh, 66 Milan San Remo, I say, okay, that's, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> not bad, yeah. yeah. In your first year as a professional, you. you no, second year. Your second year, year yeah. Uh, first, go professional first at the uh, first May 65. And then so, you, you so changed the team and, and Milan yeah. San Remo yeah. was your first yeah. Yeah. major win. Yes. I, I mean, how clearly, given the other 500 and whatever wins that came after that. How clearly can you remember Milan San Remo, that first one? Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, we were 220 riders to the start. Uh, and um, I remember I had a flat tire in the beginning. And uh, I was to follow a lot of time, but we came back then. And then there was a break uh, with 
16 rides, I think so, and I was starting the break. And then after the Capo Berta, I, I joined the, the, the first group, the, the leaders, with uh, Pulidor, I think so. And then, uh, yeah, we were doing then, uh, the, the Poggio. I know I attack in the Poggio, but uh, I cannot uh, break away. So uh, then we were with 16 in the sprint, and I beat Durante, Van Springel, Dan Shelley. And uh, ah, for me, it was an amazing victory, the first big victory. I won some races before uh, as professional in 65, but not, uh, not classics. I, I did, uh, the, the first ride I did was the Flèche Vallon, and I was dropped after 200 kilometers because I was also military. And I finished military at uh, 16 February 66, and one month later, I won uh, Milan San Remo. Did you think of you? I mean, they. We think of Milan San Remo as the sprinter's classic, the, the one opportunity, if you are a sprinter, that you, you have to, to win a monument, really. Um, did you think of yourself as a young professional, as a sprinter? What, t what no, type I, of rider did you think you were back no, then? No, no, I started? was not really a... a I, was, uh, I was a good sprinter after the long distance, but uh, in short distance, uh, we have a young rider, we have uh, Willy Plankart, Walter Goldenfroth, uh, a lot of people can beat me in the sprint, uh, but uh, after 300 kilometers, I was faster. <laughs> so <laughs> so did, you, did you know how good you were? No, I didn't know that. Also, you know, I was not, yeah, uh, I know I was good, but you know, I was also Thinking you have to also repeat, repeat. Uh, every year you start uh, from zero because you don't know what uh, yeah, the other riders, young riders coming. And uh, so uh, every year it's not like uh, you do the university. You, you have, after the university, you'll be the doctor for, for all your life in cycling. Every year it's new. Uh, and on the end of the year, you know if you're good or, or bad. Yeah, it's, it never stops. Does never it? stops, no. But for some riders, for most riders, keeping that motivation and that focus and that hunger is impossible. But for you... Yeah, you, you, but, but you know, when, when the passion, uh, you can, from the passion, do your job, there's the best, uh, beautiful things that you can have in your life. So, uh, and for me, when I started, I was also, as a young, as young boy, I was also thinking about uh, being a cyclist. Also, when I was playing basketball or football, uh, I will say later on, I, I remember, uh, I want to tell you something. I was watching TV in 1960 to the Olympics. Uh, Kapitanov won before Greek. And I say, my God, I never raced, no? Yeah, I raced once when I was 12, in, when I was born, but so... Was, and uh, I say, oh, it's time to start uh, racing, because if you want to go to Tokyo, it's time to start. And, uh, to, Four years later, I was going to Tokyo. <laughs> I didn't win the Olympics because I was Welsh one month before, and when I was young, I was growing a lot and had a lot of cramps, and I was break away the last lap. I was, was finished, and yeah, they catch me one kilometer before the finish. And that, that, that young Eddie Merckx, when you, when you dreamt of success as a cyclist, what did success mean? Did it mean the Tour de France, or did it mean Flanders and Rebecca? Every race, every race is a every race. Every race. <laughs> <Stupid> but, <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, oh, when, when Federer or Djokovic go to the court, did he play to win? So if you start a race and you don't start to win, yeah, you have to go training. <laughs> you, you train outside of the race, but if you go race, you try to win, no? The sport. Most riders are, are afraid of failure. Maybe that's it. Maybe, maybe there are most riders who are not Eddie Merckx start a race and think, well, actually, do you know what? Today, I don't like the weather. Maybe next week I have a bigger yeah. race. Maybe I'll just ride today rather yeah. than race. I mean, sometime also I go to the race. Say today ah, I'm going to ride uh, for training, but then in the race, a change and the ride to win. <laughs> How did everybody, your contemporaries, your rivals, 
the other riders in the peloton at the time, when they started to understand you, and you started to become the most important rider in, in any peloton, how did they react to you? You know, on, in the beginning, yeah, they were trying to, to beat me, and then after a few years, they tried to lose the, the race. Not to win themselves, but uh, lose the race. That was, but I have a very great team around me, very nice uh, riders, very good friends. The most of the, the team of riders like uh, nine, nine or ten years in the, uh, in the team. I have some riders who never ride for another team. Uh, Franz Minches was coming in uh, 69 to the team and uh, he stopped in uh, 76 and never go to another team. Yeah. So the, the, the team for me was, was friendship, first of all. Because I remember I could, I could go uh, in the years 74, I think so, yeah. Uh, they asked me to go to, to CAS. They pay me the double that they have, but they could only take three riders with me. I said, no, thank you. And so I stay with my team. Apart from being the great rider that you were, were you also a great leader? Was Because you need to have those qualities as a man, as but, a person, to, to lead a team as well. And was that something that for you was, yeah, was, was natural? Yeah, I think it was, I was a good leader. I was never fighting the riders in the race and things like that. Uh, yeah, so, but uh, sometimes uh, at, uh, in the evening at the table, uh, so, uh, hey, Franz, did you ride today? I didn't see you. <laughs> so, but it's, it's all for the rest. Uh, you, know, you know, they did uh, their job. It was not easy for them also because uh, we have to control all the, the races, the stages, and uh, all the classics. And yeah, the most of riders, they, they, ride, they were looking to me and uh, they did a great job too, my teammates. Eddie, when you competed in, particularly in the Tour de France, your five wins should have been six, of course, could have been six. Um, when you think about those races in particular, which riders who you beat did you have most respect for? Who were your, which rivals did you take most seriously? Well, it depends. I think Shimondi was the, the rider who was the most constant in the, the, the stage races. And then you have, uh, yeah, you have Polidor was also there, Zutemelk, uh, Van Imp, uh, then Okanya, but one year, Yes, one year, no. So, uh, and, and then Tevenet, who beats me in 75. Uh, that's the most uh, big competitors left in the stage races. Yeah. And, and of those in the Tour de France, I mean. In the Tour de France. Yeah. Oh, and then also in the Tour of Italy, it was like Fuente was a yeah. big climber we have into the Tour of Italy. He was, uh, he was not so good in the Tour de France because the speed was higher. And it was more tight in the in the mountains, but uh, in the Tour of Italy, it was oh, very difficult to beat uh, Fuente. Yeah. Was it the, um, the did the biggest threat to you come from the pure climbers? Yeah, but especially after '69, after my crash in Blois, uh, I was no more the same in the mountains than in, than before. Yeah. I never. Climb uh, as well as uh, in 269. Well, for, for the rest of your career? Yes, you for the rest of my career. career. Yeah, it, look, I won the Tour de France in 69 with 18 minutes, I was 24. Normally, when I was 55, I must be f stronger. So I must be <laughs> when with 20 minutes, then 71 with 25, and then the Leviton paid me to stay home. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, man. It's, it's, uh, it's the truth. I never climbed as, as before after, you know, my, my trainer died at the moment and I self was to the hospital and, uh, yeah, and in that time was not radiation. Uh, I was problem with my hips, it was completely turned and uh, I was six weeks in bed because of commotion and then I started again with my hips completely draw and that's make that uh, my back has still today problems. So how did that work? If you knew after that crash in 69, you knew that your climbing had changed and that you, your levels were a little bit lower, yeah. did you then work harder and harder yes. in training at, at, at climbing? Was Absol that all your focus after that? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, yeah. I was... I have to do much more 
after 69 uh, training more and, uh, and I was suffering also much more after 69 than, uh, than before. But maybe it's a good thing now because if it's too, too easy, you try it on the, <laughs> to train that much. <laughs> Eddie, can I ask you about your, your grand tour career? You are one of six riders who's won every single, uh, all three of the grand tours. No one's won it as often as you have. Um, which of them do you like the best? Which, which uh, for sure, that's 69. The first one is for me the, it's also the nice victory of my career. Because, you know, it was 30 years that a Belgian rider didn't win the Tour de France, 30 years. The last uh, rider before me was, uh, Silver Mars, 39, uh, I won in 69, so it was 30 years that uh, some Belgian riders didn't win the Tour de France. And, and uh, when I was young, 12 years, I was all watching, uh, not watching, uh, listening to the radio on the Tour de France. I was, uh, and yeah, that's why I was also supported from Stan Ockers because he, he won, was one second, was one time second and also world champion in Frascati, and he won the green jersey. And uh, I was a supporter of uh, even. Steamer was a big rider, but he did so much the Tour de France. Yeah. Was the victory in 69 the race that changed your life at that point? I mean, winning the Tour de France as the first Belgian for 30 years, when you came back home... Unbelievable. Did everything change? Everything changed, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, it was all changed a little bit before because I mean, well, I was world champion, professional. Already, yeah, yeah 60, 67, Elon. But then after winning the Tour de France, yeah, phew. When we did criteriums, there uh, was a lot of people, and uh, yeah, it was, was amazing for me. A big, uh, big event. It was great for me to win the Tour de France. It's a, a child dream, it comes true. When you're young, when I was a kid, we played Tour de France during the, with, with my friends. We ride the bike where I live, so when uh, you put on the yellow jersey, and then at once you have the yellow jersey at, uh, in, in Paris. That's the beautiful day of my career. Eddie, when did they start calling you Il Calimani? When did you first hear it? Oh, I think uh, it must be the, the first Tour de France, I think so. Uh, I have a, a rider who was calling uh, Christian Raymond, and uh, he was riding with me by Peugeot. And then I moved, and then one day on the start, he, he was on the start and his, his uh, daughter was there and he said to his daughter, look, this man, they, they take everything. And then she said, oh, it's a cannibal. <laughs> so that's uh, the first time I think in 69. And then, but during my career, only Christian Raymond called me, Kenny, who are you? <laughs> but Can not cannibal. And then after uh, they started making cannibal and things like that, but well, it's okay for me, no problem. <laughs> I don't any more meat now. <laughs> <laughs> Eat enough before. Were there ever times when you, when you thought, ah, I, do you know what? This year, I won't ride the Ghent six day. I just need a rest. I've had enough. Did it ever happen to you? Did you think I just want, I want to step away now for a time, or did your hunger for winning and for racing when? never never change? No, never change. No. No, but, but now uh, I like to ride the bike, but uh, don't like winning no. anymore. No. <laughs> I ride only for fun. And uh, yeah, during my career, it was yeah, that, that's different. How did, I mean, when your career finished, how difficult was it for you to adapt to being a man who doesn't win bike races anymore to, to that big change? No, I stopped uh, in 78, and then uh, they asked me to be. Uh, Technical director by CNA, and uh, did, and then beginning uh, sixty no seventy nine. Uh, I was looking at some proposal to be uh, public relation things like that, but then we make some uh, company to sell uh, uh, prefab uh, houses. But we never have the, the insurance for that, so it was finished. And then around May sixty. Se just, just to stop you. 79. You wanted to found a company to make pre prefabricated houses. Yes, yes, yes. 
with with uh, the company was exist <laughs> and it was with uh, Mr. Towns Mini Flat. Okay. And the, uh, the company well, the name the name of uh, was uh, the, the, the the company existed Emeta okay. with Mr. Towns, but then was not never work. And after two months, because we didn't receive the uh, homologation, yep. so from uh, it was. Uh, from Finland, yeah. and uh, then yeah, say okay. If we have not, we cannot start. We, we finish the, uh, the company, and then after was Hugo de Rosa. He asked me why you do start uh, a company in Belgium. Say, ah, but you know, I have a lot of experience in cycling, but uh, to make frames is completely different. Yeah, it's no problem. And say uh, I will help you, and I would say uh, Mr. De Rosa is a very nice guy because. If the company exists, it's because Mr. De Rosa helped me. And so, I, when I start uh, stop racing, I promised to go first of all to take vacations during the July. And I was my family going to Disney World in Florida in July. And then uh, after that, uh, we were looking. I was to Italy uh, by De Rosa to teach me how to make bikes and things like that. And so. In the beginning, and then the, the company started in, uh, in 28 March 80. So, uh, and then I was looking because I have a nice house in uh, in south of, of uh, Brussels. Prefabricated house? No, 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 because then outside you have uh, up and down, yep. and north is flat. flat. <laughs> and then I didn't like. And now I'm happy with them, them north. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Very good. Um, let's talk about cycling nowadays. Why? Let's take. Can we talk about one rider, Peter Saga? Yes. The new world champion. Yeah, great yeah, champion. Unbelievable. A little, he, bit of, a little bit of Eddie Merckx. Yeah, he, he all fighting. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I like a rider like Sagan for sure. It's, uh, it's, it's a pity that he's not a big, a good climber because otherwise, uh, for sure, he can, with his talent and his capacity, he, he could win the Tour de France. But I think he missed something for climbing. Maybe he's a bit too heavy yeah. and, uh, for climbing, and uh, that's uh, for sure in cycling. The weight for climbing is. Whew, the uh, most enemy. But let me ask you a question. If you took Peter Sagan now and transported him back 40 years and dropped him into the 1975 Tour de France, how would he get on? What, um, or in that season, what would, what would a rider like Peter Sagan have been able to do in the cycling context when you, when you were racing? Because everything has changed, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah, everything has changed, but uh, you know, uh, in the years 70s, there were big champions also in the classics. You have Roger de Vlaming, who was four times Paris Roubaix, uh, three times uh, Milan Sanremo. I think in the classics, I think uh, <laughs> it will be a good match between Sagan and uh, de Vlaming, I think so. <laughs> and Merckx. Yeah, I beat sometimes uh, <laughs> Vlaming. <laughs> Maybe sometimes uh, Sagan is going to beat me, but Milan Sanremo, I think, is more, more difficult. Yeah, yeah. It's so specialized now, isn't it? We have. It's different. It's every, interesting. Every, everything it's so changed. specialized. Yeah, but it's different. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I think I don't want to. I like more uh, my period of racing than this now because I like racing. So, and if you also prepare for that and that, I think. Uh, that's better to, to race. But, you know, we have big champions today also. And also, I think, uh, for the rider, it's more difficult uh, because you have more uh, uh, press on, if you compare, when I was riding Tour de France, you have maybe eight, nine channels to give the Tour de France. Now you have 28. So uh, the, the pressure also is harder now than it was uh, in my time. And maybe we see that reflected in, um, for example, last year when Alberto Contador, who is here this evening, and we're going to be talking to him as well, he tried to do what you did. 
he tried to win the Giro and the Tour. And even a great rider like Contador found it, it was too much. Yeah. I mean, things have changed to that extent as well, haven't they? Or, or yeah, but think I think it's, it must be possible to do uh, both. You think it's possible? Yeah. So I'll ask you another question. Take Eddie Merckx out of 1975 yeah. and put him into 2015. <laughs> no, but take Eddie Merckx for 69 and put him in, uh, in yeah. 2015. Yeah. I will win uh, both. Yeah. <laughs> For me, I think Chris Rom is the guy who will be the more possibility to win the Tour de France. I think the Tour de France, uh, like his design, I think from is the man who beat Chris going to win the Tour de France. Yeah, yeah. If you beat Chris Rom, you yeah. win the Tour de France. Yeah, if you beat uh, Chris Rom, you're uh, going to win the Tour de France. Yeah. Do you like the way he races? Yeah, I like him very. He's a very nice guy. I met him last. Now, that wasn't my question. That Sorry? Wasn't, that wasn't my question. No. I know he's a nice guy. Yeah. Do you like the way he races? He, yeah, he's a good climber. Uh, he's, he's a very good climber and uh, he's very good on the time trial. I think he's a specific stage race rider. And uh, maybe he's not a rider for classics, for the world uh, for, yeah, classics, but uh, yeah, I like, uh, yeah, he's a winner. He, he rides always, uh, and he's a great player. You could argue that he has a little bit of your killer instinct. Yes, absolutely. Do, do you see that sometimes? That yeah, yeah, absolutely. When he climbs and attacks, and he goes and again, again. Yeah. Ah, that's, that's, yeah, that's a great champion, for sure. Absolutely. And what of, um, you talk about another British rider who's still in the peloton now. Um, Mark Cavendish. Yeah, Mark is a... Who you know very well. Yeah, a fantastic guy. Yeah. Yeah, um, it's very pretty leave uh, ethics, because you know I'm in the board of uh, Decolef and the ethics uh, quick step, and he's a very nice guy. I like him very much. He's, he's absolutely... He's a fast sprinter, I think, so... Uh, I hope next year uh, he's going to uh, come back as before, because uh, he, he's a hard worker. And he's a very, very nice guy. He wants your record. Yeah, well, oh, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for me, it's not a problem. <laughs> a few years ago, maybe three or four years ago, I think we, would all, we all would have felt it's certain that, that Mark Cavendish will one day take your, your yeah, absolutely. Record. yeah, absolutely. It's, not, was it's sure. not certain now. It's a really big... I, I don't know challenge. how much he, he have, how much uh, stage wins he have today. Uh, Twenty six. Anyone going to contradict or correct? Think so. I don't know. F thirty four. No. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not so sure. I hope for him. I hope for him, but it will be difficult. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. But you, you, would, I mean, you've known. He, has visited your house on occasions, yeah. hasn't he? You've known him for a long time. Yes. Um, and he was after Tom Simpson, who yes. you rode with, and yeah. after Robert Miller yeah. as well. Robert he Miller. was maybe the next, and Chris Boardman, wow. the next British rider to, to really make an impression on the Tour de France, wasn't he? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's pretty like uh, Mark, it's unbelievable. It's like a racket. He goes uh, in the last meters and he's for me, he's the, he's the fastest rider of the history of cycling. That's not bad if it's any work to say that. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. No, I think he's fast. Cipollini was a great sprinter, for sure. But I think uh, Mark is he, a little bit faster. And Bradley Wiggins. Yeah, he's a big champion, a gentleman, and uh, he's complete. And also, if his hour record was dependent. Uh, uh, when I was at him on the bike, it's, it's great to see Bradley riding he, on the time trial, the team time trial, the world championship he won last year. And uh, also, the hour record this year, it's, uh, it's, I think, 
a lot of riders going to think twice to attack the, our records. Things it will take uh, some years yeah. before they're going to be that. Well, we, we spoke to Fabian Cancellara now, and I think he's still he can't make up his mind whether whether to try. I think to... he was to try earlier, and then I think <laughs> and, and Fabian is a good friend, no? Yeah. Uh, but I think uh, now it's last year, and uh, I hope for him. But uh, to take the our record today, I don't see one rider. Maybe uh, Tom Dumoulin, uh, but in a few years, but yeah. we have to be f stronger than than is now to to beat the record of uh, uh, Bradley. And are you pleased, um, Eddie, since you were you held the hour record for so long? It, it was one of your defining achievements. Are you pleased that the hour record has become a serious competition again? Yeah, absolutely. I think I was. When I was racing, I was all the thinking, if you don't try the hour record, your career is not complete. <laughs> because you, you, you win classics, you win Tour de France, Tour d'Italie, I think, but I think that the, the hour record is it's very special. And the most of people, when I was going for the hour record, they were thinking, ah, I cannot beat the hour record, because it was doing Mexico and uh, uh, by all Ritter. And, uh, when I go there, I was, I was sure to, to, to beat, uh, and I know the capacity of uh, Ola Ritter, mm -hmm. and uh, I know it's mine capacity, and uh, I was sure I could beat it. Yeah, yeah? I'm sure you were sure. <laughs> um, no, no, it's, no, no, I was never sure to win the Tour de France because, you know, something happened, but uh, also I was sure if, if it not accident, some, some flat tire or something like that, that I could beat uh, the hour record because, you know, if you if you two uh, flat tires uh, during the hour record, you can forget it. That's impossible. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Now we've got um, five minutes. I, I think we can open it up to questions. So please, if you have a question for Eddie, now's your opportunity. It's a chance that may never come back. It's gentleman down the front here. Eddie, for most, nearly all riders, uh, winning a Grand Tour stage or a classic is an absolutely unforgettable experience. Can you actually still remember every Grand Tour stage win and every classic? What? Good, good. good, good question. Uh, I think the, the most of them I think I can remember, yeah. The most, yeah. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. No. Try. Well, we've give, got time. Yeah, yeah. You won 34 stages of the Tour de France. You won yeah. 24 of the Giro d'Italia. No, no, no. Try to say if you remember that classic. If you say a name, I can say I remember. I can remember the the, the Milan San Remo. Yeah, I can. I can remember the Tour of Flanders. I can remember the uh, Paris Roubaix. Uh, Flesh Wallon and Lille Bassonier, I'm not so sure. <laughs> <laughs> There's only one. And then the Lombardy, yeah, I know. But Paris 2 they never win. But, uh, yeah. I think the, the five Lille Bassonniers, yeah, 69, I remember. Yeah. Van Schiel. And uh, 70? <laughs> 71, I remember. <laughs> Seven, uh, two. No, I don't. I cannot remember all the five. Uh, I think this was the Belgium classic the, the, from Valonia. And uh, which, which classic is your favourite? Or can you not answer that? Uh, yeah, for sure, Milan San Remo. Yeah. yeah, because it's the first of the season and is the longest. But the most regular is Liège Baston Liège. And it's a pity that the Tour Lombardy is a very nice classic too. Yeah. But it's late in the season. And, you know, yeah. when you ride a lot of races, like uh, I was racing, then it's come late in the season. But it's a very nice classic. All right. Two more questions. Let's take two more questions. A gentleman there. 
Um, I was interested to uh, hear Eddie's thoughts on these um, ultra-endurance events, you know, the race across America and stuff that a lot of amateurs are getting more involved in. Um, a lot of people that perhaps always want to be a professional cyclist are now going off and doing these 10-day non-stop races. And I was interested to hear your thoughts on those. The question was, um, uh, the Sorry, gentleman, he was asking you about, there are a lot of long, long endurance races now, like the Race Across America, Yes. Um, which maybe didn't exist in, in, in your day, but it seems to be much more popular now. Is that something that uh, you, you, you like the look of? How would you have gone in those? Yeah, but you know, we, we had some stage into the front in 69 <coughs> from 350 kilometers. So it was not bad too, eh? the Tour de France. <laughs> So across America, yeah, but uh, it's special, but uh, I'm, I'll never ride one day, uh, focus on one day and, uh, yeah. and off the Tour de France three weeks, but uh, so, I don't know, it was not so popular and, I, I don't, yeah, it's not so popular in, uh, in Europe, no, it's long distance, it's more uh, US cycling. Are you, are you still riding, Eddie? Yes, for sure, I'm going to ride on Sunday. I ride last uh, Saturday. So we uh, ride uh, like uh, six, six, seven thousand kilometers uh, a year, and uh, when I ride, I ride the most with old teammates, like uh, with uh, the Schumacher, uh, Sprout, Rotis comes, then we ride uh, younger riders, Fons de Wolf ride with us. Uh, I have before uh, yeah, the crash now the guy, but he's 80 years. Uh, uh, my sir is still riding, and uh, and then we we in a group of. Of ten people, and we ride uh, Saturday and Sunday in the, in the summer. We, we ride uh, three times a week, and then uh, we don't stop. But after the the ride, we stopped at my house, where the factory was, and the the, the, the big office. There was two offices. We make one big table, a berkel, wine, beer, <laughs> prosciutto. <laughs> Last question, very quickly. Eddie, um, thank you. Um, I was talking with an ex-pro last weekend after a ride together, and he'd ripped my legs off. And we were talking about the pro peloton, and he said, I don't believe that today there is a truly natural, gifted rider like Merckx riding today. He said, I just think they're better prepared and better trained than ever before. And you were talking about Sagan, and I just wondered what your thoughts were in response to my friend's comments about being gifted or better trained. Did you understand no, the question? No. The question Sorry, was, my English is not that good. No, the, the question was, uh, Eddie, um, how much, I think, the, I'm going to paraphrase you, how much of what you achieved was really down to an extraordinary natural gift, a natural talent yes. that you had? Yeah, yeah, the change that my parents make me like that. <laughs> <laughs> and then also uh, the, the talent, but also I think uh, art very hard. I, I work very hard. Uh, I tell you, uh, it's a hard job. Yeah. And uh, if you believe as a sportman, believe me, you cannot stay 10 years on the top. That's impossible. Uh, and the only is training, uh, and live as a sportman. That's that's a. Well, uh, if you don't do that, it's, it's impossible to to stay uh, ten years on the top. You can have the talent. Look, Frank van der Broek had a big talent, but if talent is not enough, you have to work very hard. And I think it's in every sport. Every sport. Uh, if you don't work, you don't you cannot stay on the, on the top. Now listen, um, Eddie Monks is not leaving us. He's going to come back a little bit later in the evening with um, Brett Horton to be reunited with some of your racing jerseys. Okay. Uh, Brett Horton has come over from the States with the most extraordinary collection of racing jerseys just around the corner there. Brett's going to be talking a little bit about that and um, reintroducing Eddie to some of the uh, bits of knitwear he wore back in the day. Um, but in the meantime, um, that was Eddie Merckx, ladies and gentlemen. Brett,